First of all, thank you all for joining for this session. This is a little bit uh, different than our other sessions in the sense that we have a specific proposal that we would like to brainstorm with you, uh, and uh, which is directly related to the Global Leadership in the 21st Century Project. It's uh, on what happens after this conference, the main conference in October, and our final report to the UN. So we wanted to take advantage of uh, so many knowledgeable people coming to brainstorm about an idea that is part of the project. I'd like to start by giving a brief background about this, uh, uh, this subject of a master's course in leadership for global social transformation. In 2013, we uh, conducted our first meeting in collaboration with UNOG on the need for a new paradigm in human development. And sometime around then, we were approached by the United Nations Association uh, in, uh, from New York saying, hi, Olivia, is looking for you. Thanks for joining. We were approached by the UN organization saying that uh, many of our members would like to continue their education in order to acquire greater knowledge for dealing with the complexities uh, that the World Academy is talking about and that we were discussing at the conference. And can we help them uh, with some type of educational programs? And frankly, we were deeply immersed in dealing with, with the problems and trying to work out solutions, but we weren't at the stage of where we felt we could go and, uh, and offer such programs. After that, we launched a series of what we called courses. I think it totaled about 15, which were really curriculum development programs within the academy and with a lot of outside collaboration on different facets of the issues we've been studying that we thought would be necessary to come to comprehensive solutions. And that ultimately led us to the second proposal to UNOG, which that is for the Global Leadership in the 21st Century Project. And this conference, the conference that's coming up in October, our final report, which we've agreed to write, and we included in that proposal the idea that as a result of this project, we would come up with some course material that could be used extensively, not only within the UN system, but with national governments, with uh, diplomats, with business leaders, with the heads of NGO organizations, with educators, with engineers and technologists or anyone else because we realized the more we were working on it, that there's a no essential knowledge necessary to understand what's going on in the world today, let alone the processes by which we try to effectuate change in the world. And we were not satisfied with the existing knowledge that's being promoted through uh, existing educational system. So this is the origin of this discussion and our goal is to come up with those programs in the period after uh, the conference in Geneva and the final report. And I won't go into the, the, the subject matter. I think you've all, I hope you've all received the outline. I wanted to just say something about the outline. The, the, rash, the purpose of this was to be illustrative, certainly not to be either comprehensive or final. It was written about a year and a half ago, uh, and it was trying to conceptualize what would be the difference in approach that we think is necessary to really prepare ourselves and other people for understanding and acting more effectively on global social issues. And this was the result of our 15 discussions that we held, uh, courses or curriculum development workshops that we held, fascinating learning experiences involving many people from different perspectives, multidisciplinary rather, transdisciplinary. And we realized that there were certain recurring themes, whether we're talking about democracy or global governance 
or economy or financial systems or ecology uh, or education. And all of these were core subjects of, uh, that we've been working on. Uh, that there were certain core themes that kept coming back over and over again. And that was, we came to the conclusion that the challenges we face today are very much the result of the way we're thinking and of the type of thinking that's being promulgated uh, through our educational system globally uh, at this time. The very idea of having specialized dis disciplines that fragment reality into airtight compartments uh, is itself contrary to the reality of the world we live in. The idea that we can talk about economy separate from political science or, we, or separate from ecology or separate from society uh, is, a, is a mental artifice. It's not a real reality. And a, a structure of the theory on which our social sciences are based is equally very much compartmentalized as if we can really isolate the pure economic factors from the social, cultural, political, ecological, uh, and, and co other factors involved. And so the need for integrality in thinking, as well as integrality in theory, because our policies, our institutions are based on the same kind of divisions. So we, we, we had two uh, very wonderful programs on the way we think and the evolution of the way we're thinking and the way we need to be thinking differently in the future if we're going to be able to solve these problems. We had programs on our educational system and the way we perpetuate problems by not only the way we've divided reality, but the theoretical framework in which that division is based. And we've been doing work with others on, on those. We found that whatever the subject we were coming up to, values, the power of values was a core that we could not escape, that the integrating factor for finding solutions that will really be viable was always based on a question of rights, values, and how those ideals get translated into practice in law in institutions and in action. We had fascinating discussions on the role of power. And it's ironic that you can go through a whole uh, uh, course in, ec in economics without the word power ever being mentioned because power belongs to po political <laughs> politics. Uh, but in fact, uh, the role of economy and the role of money in the way the world works, it in fact, uh, affects everything. And when we look, the more we looked at power, the more we realized we're talking about the, the specific capacity of the society to solve its problems and how these capacities are interlinked with each other. So uh, the, the idea of power to accomplish was a recurring theme. The principle of organization, it was interesting that uh, uh, that though we all use the word organization all the time, uh, that to really understand the role of organization in society and the way that uh, social organization is evolving uh, and the power that is generated by organization was a recurring theme that seems to permeate all the topics that we were discussing. We're calling these transdisciplinary themes uh, rather than uh, discipline-specific themes. And of course, uh, one of the characteristics of our social sciences is that we have tried to objectify them, tried to normalize them, try to reduce them to quantitative statistics so that we can measure them and be very scientific about them. And yet the more we went into in our discussions, we found that the subjective dimension of reality, whether it's of the individual or the collective, was so powerful, so determinative, that unless we were gonna make, give that a prominence and recognize that the objective expression was the result of subjective perceptions, attitudes, aspirations, and values, we would not be able to understand the process. 
And I'm just giving these as examples to kind of reflect very briefly the kind of thought processes that we've been exploring within the academy, not trying to be comprehensive and certainly not doing, trying to do uh, justice to them. Uh, in, in the, I just wanted to frame the, the way we have conceived of this, uh, the need for this program. So everything from thinking and values to social institutions, social organization, culture, uh, as something that runs through the whole social process. And when we came to the project on global leadership and what this is all about, we finally found ourselves uh, formulating the thought this way. Society has been evolving for centuries. It's been evolving for millennium, of course, but very, very slowly. It's been evolving more rapidly uh, in the last few centuries with increasing speed. And now we are at a point where the speed and the direction of that evolution, which seems to be happening by itself without the conscious uh, volition of humanity as a whole, certainly without the forethought and planning that we, uh, uh, by humanity as a whole, suddenly we're faced with the fact that if it keeps going on without control, without leadership, without much greater forethought and anticipation, that the consequences could be uh, quite devastating and even irreversible. And therefore, what we need is to make this evolution more conscious than it's ever been before. Uh, and we need to understand the process, not only of the evolution better, but we have to understand the process by which we can convert a subconscious process where nobody's in charge to a more consciously directed process. And of course, in practice, this is what we're trying to do. The world is trying to do through the SDGs, an unprecedented effort. We've never before had humanity come together and agree to anything uh, in 193 countries, uh, let alone uh, 17 goals and 169 targets. And this is one form of leadership. So the broad topic of our discussion is, what can we do? What can we offer? We're not talking in this session about transforming the whole global educational system Ramus uh, helped us do that in the previous session, so all those problems have been resolved, as far as we're going to do them today anyway. Uh, we're taking a much more modest goal. Uh, we're asking ourselves, as a result of this project, what knowledge, how could we formulate a systematic knowledge and deliver it? We have talked about a master's course because that was our first thought this may have many, many different forms in which uh, it, may, it may go. But what we're interested in today is not so much the form as actually the content uh, that should go into it and how we can draw on existing knowledge and, uh, uh, and get your thoughts and experience on how we might go about it and how we may collaborate with others in, in doing it more successfully. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to thank you for joining us and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I saw Grazina join us and uh, Olivia, excellent. So I'm very pleased to have such great scholars, also sub practitioners as Gary explain the philosophy approach, the need. Uh, I want to focus on uh, very practical things as <laughs> based on my 50, almost two years academic experience. And so we believe that it should be a professional, but with high academic standards program, which should uh, be developed in type of evolution. Probably we should start with single courses designed by teams, two, three persons, and then uh, uh, put together after evaluations. We have the schedule at the end, but we'll see whether we will have time to, to discuss it. But the idea is the first year of the program should focus on general issue to give the common platform 
for all enrolled uh, uh, students. I mean, mostly practitioners, but anyway, so we'll discuss. And the second year, um, we'll have advanced courses, uh, starting with uh, capstone, diploma seminar, or in some cases uh, with the thesis. I mean, in US, we rarely see the thesis, thesis you know, I mean, dissertations. We mostly focus on projects, very often team projects. And, and then uh, uh, we will have three specializations. Uh, 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 first, uh, or uh, I, I don't know, uh, I have a question for administrators because it would be easier for us if, we, if you could put our presentation and then there are some details. Uh, Vasugi, if I could help you to put, put presentations because I really, I have an open one, but I don't know how to attach it, you know, anyway, in this program. But anyway, I hope we will have the, uh, the presentation, but you read, all of uh, panelists read our program, so you know. So three uh, paces, three specialization, mobilizing uh, society for uh, achieving Agenda 2030, I mean, with uh, sustainability development goals. And the second would be, I mean, we can add to this probably also to participate actively in European or American or whatever green deal uh, uh, which happening. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, specialization oriented on corporate creativity, learning networks and uh, social innovation. And the third one, uh, would be on uh, leadership and individual uh, accomplishment. Next slide, please. Okay, in terms of next slide, please. Okay, we combined the uh, uh, program uh, into following elements. So the first uh, 15 uh, core modules, uh, as Gary mentioned, we have already practiced discussions. We assume that each of them could be offered for, for uh, European uh, credits. Um, I mean, uh, ECT. Uh, these are multi-dimensional, uh, multi-dimensional uh, global challenges, untapped resources, engine of global development, anticipated consequences of social awareness, evolution of the technology of social organization, human rights, values, and culture, social power money and social power next please and then the social learning uh, with multiplier effects individual achievements social accomplishments process of social accomplishments perception thinking creativity particularly critical thinking and higher mental development process of integration in business education evolution uh, evolution of uh, humanity Maybe we can expand this uh, with the designing, uh, implementing, uh, and evaluating institutions. The next uh, component would be a capstone uh, diploma project or thesis, but we would like to, to see this as uh, action research. Next, please. And then we are assigned uh, eight uh, credits. And the third part, I mean, the, the third part would contain methodological. Uh, courses and advanced as well as electives. So for methodological courses, for sure we need, you know, I mean, it's always required for graduate studies anywhere. Uh, in advanced economies, introduction to analytical methods, both qualitative and quantitative. And advanced uh, courses, uh, for instance, we presented two examples, uh, one uh, designed uh, I mean, uh, designing, implementing, uh, assessing institutions, or the course or examples of electives, project management for sustainability designed by Rajina Leśniak-Webkowska from Warsaw School of Economics, or my course, Building a Sustainable Business Organization. And then we also envision, this is a professional, I mean, assume it will be very practical, professional program, but with high academic standards, it could proceed within the PhD track 
which could have three specialization, diplomatic, public, and business, and civic. Okay, next, please. And uh, so far, we have the four uh, consortium partners, World Academy, World University Consortium, uh, Person Center Approach Institute, uh, led by uh, Alberto, the Mother uh, Service Society in India, and we will select uh, universities which will participate. So this is something what I hope to, to hear from you, the uh, uh, suggestions. Next slide, please. So now we can move to uh, the uh, panel discussion and then uh, uh, we have eight questions. Let's start with the first one and I would like to uh, invite uh, Alberto Zucconi, the uh, chair of uh, uh, board, board of Trustees of World Academy of Art and Science and Secretary General of World University Consortium. Alberto, the floor Thank is you, yours. Quick. Well, uh, in three minutes, uh, I want to underline uh, what is uh, the most important. I don't think uh, it's such an easy challenge. I think uh, it's a very meaningful challenge and a high risk of failure. In my opinion, it will be a failure if uh, we don't think uh, about being transparent uh, of uh, the pedagogy and the uh, you know, social construction uh, that is behind the offering in such a course. In other words, uh, no matter what, uh, any course uh, has an embedded uh, pedagogy and any pedagogy has uh, embedded uh, value. We need, uh, in my opinion, to make that explicit. In other words, we need uh, to walk our talk. Then uh, I think uh, that uh, the student body and uh, the teaching body, I would propose uh, more than a professor and teachers uh, facilitator on learning. That is not the less rigorous. Uh, actually, the research show that uh, you can achieve more than traditional education. And I think uh, we should have an uh, equal amount uh, or as much equal as possible of uh, uh, women, uh, men, uh, people from different culture, and uh, hear a different voice. Uh, so it's not going to be uh, a replication of some, uh, you know, tipping. And also the issue of power. The issue of power, I think, is relevant. Uh, not about what we're going to talk directly, but how we're going to share power and encourage uh, the emerging uh, of a natural leadership. Uh, among uh, not this master, of course a master, of course rigorous, but I see much better and much more congruent of what we're saying uh, to create a, a community of learning where the process uh, is going to be also the product uh, and we can measure and not just us from the outside uh, all together. So, I think, uh, and I am excited to participate, uh, and when uh, uh, I say participate, I am greedy. I hope I'm going to learn uh, more than I can teach. Thank you, Alberto. You stick really to three minutes. I appreciate. And uh, next, I would like to uh, ask Remus, who, who had some time constraints, to be sure that uh, we hear your voice. Okay. Remus? Thank you. Very happy Are to. Are you there? Okay. Very happy to be able to participate to this uh, session. Gary introduced to me some years ago uh, the idea. Also, the idea was uh, presented uh, briefly to Geneva last year when we had a, a first meeting with the member states. Uh, let me start in my first intervention with uh, two stories. One very short story. One is uh, um, an opinion of Edward Burney. Edward Burney was a nephew of um, uh, 
a very well-known uh, psychologist, and uh, at one moment he said, we have a huge gap between the school and society. The, in fact, the school, is, the school is lying. During the classes, we teach our students everything is coherent, everything should be connected, when in fact the life is really incoherent and not necessarily the dot uh, uh, connected. Uh, probably in his uh, discussions with um, his uh, uncle, Freud, uh, he discovered all the time there are conflicts between uh, some uh, uh, components and uh, the way uh, uh, people are thinking and the society. So this is one first um, uh, story. The second one, for sure you know Walter Lippmann and John Dewey the philosopher and the political scientist and the journalist, for almost three decades, they debated in the uh, American um, uh, opinion, public opinion, the idea who is supposed to decide when there is an issue in the society. And Walter Liebman in a, a book in uh, 2022 said, at one moment, experts should decide and is no reason to ask citizens because in fact it is a deficit of democracy. Why to ask people about, uh, I don't know, very sophisticated um, uh, public topics. And Lippmann said it is a deficit of democracy. And for this reason, the technocrats have to come and address this issue. And John Dewey said, okay, I can agree it is a deficit of democracy, but that means we need more democracy. What I want to say with these two aspects, probably our objective is not to establish a master degree. Our objective is, uh, my time is, uh, it's... Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. One more minute. Just to, yeah, go ahead. just to conclude, so our objective is not to establish a master degree, just to establish a master degree, but to establish a master degree that will help society on one hand to have something between uncoherent approach and coherent approach, and on the other hand, to have more democratic approach. And probably in the second round, I'll be able to share with you how I see <laughs> this master program in order really to have impact because otherwise there are great master programs in different universities around the world. But the question is how we succeed to uh, penetrate at the level of society and to contribute to give solution in a democratic way. Thank you, Remus. Uh, I, I apologize, I forgot to introduce you. Uh, Remus is current, uh, uh, re uh, rector of uh, National University of Political Sciences and Public Administration in Bucharest, Romania. And he's also was, uh, was a fellow. Okay, and former Minister of Education in Romania. Uh, thank you. Let's move now to a uh, third speaker. I would like to ask, Christine, could you uh, uh, join uh, share with, with us your uh, views. Are you there? Christine is yeah. a professor of law, European law, and the chair of uh, Jean Monnet uh, Center of Excellence at the Geneva University. Yes, please. Your floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Gary Jacobs and the World Academy for inviting me uh, to participate in this panel. So uh, I'm very pleased to share with you uh, my experiences and my thoughts because um, uh, as uh, David Chigweidze probably told some of the board, uh, we are running uh, already uh, for the fourth edition an MEIG program, you can see behind me, we have uh, the roll-up, uh, Master, Master of Advanced Studies in European and International Governance. And we are having these uh, in partnership with UNOG, with United Nations Office at Geneva. 
And um, it's very, very interesting uh, to listen to what Gary just mentioned in the introduction, because many of the issues uh, that have been raised are uh, in fact what we thought about when we created, when we established uh, our master in European and global governance uh, at the University of Geneva. And, um, uh, uh, and so in fact, my thought on how, in order to answer the first question, I, if I may say it like this, uh, we implemented parts, partially at least uh, at the University of Geneva. Uh, and uh, I will be pleased to work with all of you on, on, on your master, uh, on your project. So um, um, uh, it's, it's really uh, with uh, continuing with UNO, continuing with the World Academy. So first, I think what is very important and uh, in my view, and that has put into place in this MEIG program, I think that uh, in order to make an education program, a master program, whatever the name of it, uh, different from what exists, I think the link between academic and professional life is very important. So the bridge between university, between the academic and the Geneva International is very important. And uh, in fact, you have only three places where you can really run with this is Vienna, New York and Geneva, if you really want to have the UN, UN family in it. So, this is, was, was a very important point for us. Second point is really to prepare, our objective was to prepare either for an international career or uh, to a national career, but dealing with international affairs. And this would equip diplomats, UN officials, NGOs, leaders, etc. So the, the ideas you have in your paper are, 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 in, 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 uh, are taken into consideration. Transdisciplinarity, of course, is a point. Uh, what uh, I, th I take for very important, intercultural uh, groups, both in the participants and in the professors, in the academic or, or practitioners, um, intergenerations as well. Uh, I think uh, passing the message is very important and our main focus, and I think it's very important in our time of COVID-19 and everything, is the multi-level governance. So really to look at all the objective of SDGs at multi-level. So we take it at, of course, global, regional. Of course, we focus a bit on European, but not only. We have really a regional approach and national and local. So it's really, I would say these are our main focus uh, a part of practical skills. Practical skills are the basis. So link between academic and professional and then make the bridge between the two and the diversity as I mentioned. But I don't want to take the floor for the first, my first intervention too long and I can come back with, with other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Christine. So, uh, First of sharing with your experiences and also for your readiness to work with us. So we can learn from you and from your uh, institutions a lot. And uh, thank you for support of this idea. Okay, let's move to the second question. Uh, and then I will ask uh, uh, Benno uh, Varland. Benno is... Uh, a professor of the Friedrich Schiller University in uh, Jena, Germany, and he is also UNESCO chair for uh, the understanding sustainability, the area which is very close for me. Okay, Ben, it's your floor. Yeah, thank you very much, and um, hello to everyone. Um, my experience, uh, I tried twice to uh, establish a master program in the direction this program is going. One was uh, linked to the International Year of Global Understanding I invented and, and directed. And to have uh, such a course um, at the University of Vienna. And the second one was um, in cooperation with the Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Young Leadership. And both have been very exciting projects, but 
the institutional barriers uh, were very complicated. I mean, I just learned that if you have a hub like Geneva, Vienna, or New York, then maybe these um, institutional barriers can be uh, softened, at least because you have an organization behind that helps you to, to overcome uh, uh, university um, division of labor and the scientific division of labor. So in my view, what the content should be is that we need to overcome nationalistic and regionalistic views of the world. Because all of us went through a, a long time of a nationalistic brainwash. We, everything is organized nationally, the data, uh, curricula, institutions, and so on. So if you want to have a global perspective, and just uh, fulfilling the criteria that have been uh, mentioned by the two speakers before me, uh, to have a, a global perspective and people from everywhere in the world, then we need, first of all, a global vision of, uh, of the problems we are confronted because most of, most of them have, have a global uh, span and, and the global, global implications. So that's, in my view, we need to fulfill such a program has to fulfill two points. First, a global perspective. And secondly, um, a transdisciplinary view that has already been mentioned. And thirdly, not just a global perspective, but a global perspective for local lives, for the local context, how we can engage locally to contribute to the solution of global problem constellations in the world of the biophysical world as well as the social, cultural, and economical uh, respect. So I think the problem then is that we don't have many people that are trained in these perspectives. Most of us have been trained in a discipline and experiences the, the barriers and the rather narrow boundaries of each of our disciplines, but to overcome them uh, in, a, in a perspective is very crucial, but also at the same time, probably very challenging. And of course, we need to address this program also to young people. So we need the engagement of young people. And for this, I think it's very important to not train them too much in the disciplinary manner of the of the established uh, educational systems, we need to overcome them as Gary mentioned in his introduction. And I think these are the five main pillars of such a program with all of them specific challenges we need to overcome. Thank you, Benno. Vielen Dank. Uh, you are such great panelists. So you are so disciplined, you know. <laughs> Okay, let's move to the second question. Uh, and then uh, what issue and knowledge should we examine, I mean, both ethical and practical relevance for those seeking to understand social impact in the global, national, and local level? Already Menno mentioned this uh, uh, issue, so let's expand this. So may I ask uh, uh, Grazina to, to contribute uh, she was also a contributor to this program. We have mentioned three major authors, but you know there are many uh, people who contributed. Rajina was one of them, uh, Rodolfo, and so on. We discussed this uh, uh, um, earlier. But uh, she is professor of Warsaw School of Economics and they ran for 10 years the most successful executive master uh, program from the University of Minnesota. Okay. Your the floor is yours. yours uh, thank you, Zvika. Nice to see you guys. Uh, beautiful pictures. Uh, I'm sorry that we cannot meet uh, in a real life, but uh, the, the day will come. Um, if you allow, Zvika, I will address uh, one information referring to the uh, question number one and, uh, and, and two. Some of them uh, were already mentioned, but for me it is important. Um, the structure of all the science is extremely complex. Uh, uh, it's so much fragmented and uh, everybody wants to become a leader in a narrow discipline to become a unique person uh, and to offer something uh, uh, valuable uh, to, to, to the public. But it means uh, that uh, you know, we have to uh, change the orientation from uh, uh, orientation towards uh, employability 
and our uniqueness uh, serves uh, this purpose to sustainability and sustainability and employability are not on the same uh, track of change that we want to uh, introduce um, especially uh, that uh, if we are looking at um, any track of study um, uh, we uh, try to uh, to show some general issues and then everybody wants to become a, a specialist and how to uh, uh, how to um, combine uh, uh, those uh, narrow skills uh, with the fast uh, promotions you learn uh, along uh, with your with your practice and, um, and and experiences to become leader to to have a broader impact on on the population but uh, it is difficult, you know, how to map all the courses within the concept of sustainability and simultaneously to provide the uh, employability for all the graduates. So uh, uh, I think it's uh, one of the most important um, uh, perspectives. And the second um, uh, that um, Benno mentioned and Remus too, uh, it's uh, um, that uh, we are speaking about consistency and continuity of interdependent uh, actions. Uh, so it's, it's a really a very challenging uh, task, how to make uh, consistent something that is uh, in, independent and tries to be uh, independent that is different. Uh, but uh, what we really uh, tr have to do, it's uh, creating the, the, the map uh, of navigating the analysis from local to global, and from global to local. So what are the paths of transition? And uh, from ideas to goals, uh, through actions uh, and understanding the trade-offs that we do uh, with, with uh, if we achieve one goal, we have to make some trade-offs and to sacrifice uh, other benefits. Uh, so there is no just a genius solution for, uh, for, uh, for everybody that uh, we will only create a good. We are aimed at creating a good for, for the population, for the society, but uh, those paths of transitions are full of perils. And uh, depending on the, on, the, on the perspective that you adopt, uh, the, the path of transition will be, will be different. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the second um, remark. <clears throat> And uh, another thing is uh, what should be uh, protected, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, cultural heritage that shouldn't be any, any trade-off. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not substitutable. Um, we have to um, uh, focus a contingent um, approach to, to everything. So there are so different contexts of our actions uh, that there is no just one, uh, the same situation for every country, every um, every industry or every domain of, of activity. Uh, there is also the issue of uh, strong political support needed to implement the proposed uh, ventures um, and institutions and processes and projects and programs. So uh, without the financial support of somebody, it, it will be difficult to change uh, something that is uh, well anchored in the existing um, uh, environment. Uh, so uh, the, the, we are moving to the third one, Zbig. Yes, let's move to the okay. third one. Yeah, uh, the, the the issue. One okay. Is Unless second. somebody is raising a hand to add to the second question. Okay. Well, let's <coughs> move to the the, third one. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, briefly, Grazina, um, if you want. The and third one is, uh, is not a brief one, one, unfortunately, because uh, it uh, undermines the value of traditional uh, knowledge and disciplines and ways of teaching. Uh, I have in mind the VOCA type of environment, so that is, uh, <clears throat> that is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. So it means that there is no ready-made solutions and then tracks uh, for achieving the success. Uh, so it requires totally different uh, strategies of uh, learning and teaching that are based rather on uh, curiosity and discovery that is proposed by Gary and pointed out by Gary in, uh, in his uh, concept. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, it uh, always uh, should uh, verify and test the value of existing knowledge. It follows uh, in line uh, with the concept of Glazer and Strauss of the theory, uh, building of the grounded theory that we have to uh, we have to be skeptical about the values of existing uh, theories and we have to undermine them, focusing on the specific uh, problems, uh, uh, issues that we want to, to progress with. Uh, yeah. And uh, undermining it means that we have to co-create and to verify the existing knowledge. 
think I think I'll okay. Let... Thank you, Grazina. We uh, to uh, 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 Thomas. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Well, let me just say that I wanted to sort of const contextualize this, this venture a little. And uh, in Australia, where I worked and also elsewhere, fee-paying masters, master's programs came into vogue in the 1990s. Uh, they grew like mushrooms at that time, and many were of poor quality. They were really just focused on making quick money for universities to make up for government funding cuts at the expense of hapless students who uh, were told at that time they needed further education to, to keep upgrading their, uh, their qualifications in a fast moving workplace. So in that kind of uh, uh, context, I think it's important to provide really high quality. And if, if that can be done, and I'm sure we can do that, then it'll stand out. And it also has to be unique in some ways, and I think it is conceptually, uh, quite unique what is proposed in the draft uh, document. Though I have some suggestions. One is I think that methodology is not given enough attention because it what will give learner it is what will give learners the unique skills that distinguish them from someone who has not taken the course. Theory and understanding alone, I think, are not enough. And in, in general, in academic curricula, instruction in applied research methodology is often lacking. It's, it's always a step, the stepchild. But if this is to be an exceptional, exemplary, and high-value course, that issue needs to be addressed. A leader is only as good as her toolkit. And in today's world, I also should add digital design skills should be part of that toolkit. Because, I mean, leaders do not need to be IT experts, but they must know what is possible and what is involved. I also would like to suggest that more attention be given to the obje objective challenges the world faces today. That means leaders need to know in some depth the science around issues like climate change and where to look for the latest science. So far, most leaders don't really know. They think they know. Some of them talk about the need for urgent, urgent action. So they are aware of the problem, but they don't know just how extreme the situation is. It's like a Russian roulette, except instead of having one bullet in the six chambers, we have three now, soon we'll have four, okay? Then you spin and you pull the trigger. That's what we're doing statistically, but it just doesn't sink in. It's very hard uh, to for people to understand that if they don't have really up-to-date science uh, information. And finally, I would recommend mentoring uh, as perhaps the best way to enhance uh, capabilities of, of, of leadership trainees. Now, bringing mentors in, in into as a residential lectures would be very expensive and perhaps not economically viable. And I would therefore think it's better uh, to for, for learners to work with mentors in a practical context through internships. And I know that students definitely are looking for internships when they choose these courses. They want work experience. They know it boosts their employment chances. So that's another mark of uh, distinction. And, and, and finally, mobility. I think it would be good if students uh, spend their time across several ca uh, campuses in different countries in the one course. So have mobility built in so they get cross-cultural experience. They learn to find their way in, in a new place and take responsibility for themselves in that way. So there's a bit of built-in travel. Uh, that would also be uh, helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I saw Gary wanted to, uh, I mean, he's co-moderator. I don't want to monopolize my role. <laughs> okay. I only Gary. want Olivia a chance to speak. She was signaling, I thought, and she wasn't getting... Okay. I'd be delighted to share the, I mean, the, the floor uh, with Olivia. Olivia, please. The yes. Floor's yours. Thank and you, I... and thank okay. you, Gary. Um, I feel ashamed because I actually even prepared a PowerPoint and it has 21 slides, so I don't think I'll fit that in three minutes. Not with all the endeavor in the world. So I will just 
start sharing some ideas that cover actually both the free questions we are already uh, engaging with. Is that's all right? Um, mainly, I wanted to give some contribution in terms of the core question that you've 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 opened up, which is how to change through education the range of challenges that Gary has always so beautifully um, summarized for us. And um, I want to basically link back to Alberto's initial uh, in, in intervention, because I very much share pretty much everything he said. And having read the draft masters, for me, one core issue to discuss is indeed, what is it that we stand for? And, and how clear it needs to be. And I think it needs to be crisp clear. And it is not in, in the draft. It may presumably because it's a draft, but, but it can also be a strategy. 99.9% .9 of master courses do not say what they stand for, apart from using uh, those, those keywords that we all throw into the pile for whatever purpose at whatever season that they stand in. So I think that for challenge one would be to, can we agree to what it is that we do stand for and therefore what it is that the masters should stand for or whatever course we, we decide is, is appropriate. Um, and in this, I, maybe I throw in what, so, let's say one issue here is the ethos and the purpose of the endeavor. Um, and my, my offer here would be to, to link to the, the discourses about cultural change, which I thought were in the draft and have been mentioned both explicitly and implicitly by the speakers before me but that is not terribly clear in the draft as it is. We use a lot the term society, societal change. I have become almost allergic to that word for the amount of abuse it has received. Um, cultural change that aims to be life affirming, that aims to be equitable and in favor of regenerative futures. That for me would be an example of something that I would like to say, I stand for this and I, the course stands for this. Um, but as you will have noted, I have used um, purposefully language that is not in the draft, is not commonly used. And this links to, I cannot remember whether I read it in one of the commentaries or someone said it, but um, I feel that we need to embrace uh, significantly more with the whole discourse of post-development and the whole discourse of ways of knowing in indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, which are currently a bit uh, mm, nuanced and quite absent, I would say, in the draft. And sorry to sound so critical, but I, what I, it's, it's really just to, to offer some other ways of, of thinking about the material. Um, and here I, I want to offer an example of an existing United Nations experience that uh, Thomas is going to be horrified, but I will quote it anyway. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services conceptual framework, which I can show later, but the point here is it's a UN, um, it's linked to the United Nations Biodiversity Convention efforts and what it is significantly interesting about it is it puts on paper that there is a Western science and that there is another way of knowing. It puts it in the same graph and it acknowledges uh, the obvious, of course, but the obvious is so un invisible in our, in our education system. And here, Gracinha made a, a beautiful summary of some of the issues and, and previous speakers also. I mean, we can the obstacles to any of the things that we're proposing are huge in, in a standard institution. So I, I, I think I'll leave it to Thank the ethos and purpose. I have several other things, but I just wanted to open up with this uh, link. I think I'd like to just comment here if I could, because Olivia's comments are so important and so relevant. Uh, and it makes me laugh a little, because when I look at the draft and I see uh, 
that the core on which the whole thing is based is not explicitly stated. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering how that's possible because Alberto knows in everything we write, the first thing we're talking is human-centered value-based. And somehow in writing this draft, I mean, the whole basis, because we've been doing this for six years, every course we talk, every idea we talk about is human-centered value-based <laughs> sustainability. And you're absolutely right. At a, <laughs> when I look at the draft, I don't see, the, I don't see it explicit. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe because we've been talking to the same people for so long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very important. I just wanted to reinforce what you said. Absolutely important. And thank you for, uh, we can be blind. Pavel, I think you're, you have something to please. Go ahead. Uh, can I'm, I just add one thing, Gary? Thank you. I, um, very quickly, the, another thing that struck me in the, in, the, in the draft is we seem to embrace uh, complexity in a way that I find problematic uh, in the sense that it, it's generally something that A is inevitably increasing and that we need to, em if not embrace, we need to engage it and learn to deal with it. There is literally a phrase where, which is uh, we, we should stop resisting to it. Now, whilst this is a huge topic, what I wanted to share here is that no, I would like to also problematize the complexity. Um, and I would like to suggest afterwards, I can send this material, there is a Canadian scholar on peace studies, uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, uh, who worked on synchronous failures. And his treatment of complexity is incredibly problem problematized in a way that I think is very important for, the, for a course on leadership with this ethos. Um, so that we, and, and because of what you just said about your work with Alberto, indeed, if to, to be very sim simple, hopefully not simplistic, uh, a master's course of this kind would probably have to see itself as at addressing two very broad, different types of drivers of change. One relating to everything that is outside the self and the person, which are the institutions, the problems, the sectors, and so on. And the other, which is the person and the psychology, the spirituality, the consciousness. And you touch on both, but, but perhaps by clarifying that there are these two bodies that are, of course, interdependent, but they're very different targets, normally not treated together in a, in a master's course. That was one of the things that I thought was very powerful in the draft. Thank you, Olivia. Obrigado. I forgot to introduce you. Uh, maybe yeah. international scholar, you see, Gary, and then from uh, now working with Portugal, but also in Italy, in Hong Kong, worldwide. This is why it was very good reminder for us. We, it was so obvious for us what uh, we are stand for that we forgot to explicitly express, Gary. Yeah, I'd just like to reply because Olivia's comments are so pertinent and they'll be lost, be hard to reconstruct it, but I'm going to do it very briefly and mark it for future discussion because the points are subtle. Uh, I think the theme behind the project is not just complexity, but integrality. The integrality is a reality of life. The complexity is something that's developing over time because of our institutional interactions. And uh, so, uh, but what we're basically arguing for is the integrality has always been there, but we have academically abstracted it and divided it. The complexity is evolving uh, and both need to be addressed but a topic for further discussion. Yeah. This, is, this is the creative. The second point, and then I'd like, let's hear from Pavel because he's been very patient. The second point is a little different. You raise the point of the subjective and the objective. And we have spent a lot of time on this in our courses at Dubrovnik. And I would say it a little differently, that there are not really two domains. There is, one reality that we have arbitrarily divided 
and abstracted and tended to focus on the objective and suppress the, uh, uh, the subjective. Uh, and in our discussions on these subjects, even in economics, even in money, uh, let alone in politics and social power and everything, they're really inseparable. Uh, so we're trying to get back to the wholeness uh, rather than think of them as two separate things. And incidentally, because you talked about traditional knowledge, I will put on the table the fact you know, we had two programs on mind thinking and creativity uh, in which these issues came up. The relation of the objective to the subjective of different ways of knowing uh, and all. And uh, uh, having moved from California to India many years ago, uh, uh, where I really re recognize, learn from a different culture the fact that the, uh, the subjective is there in everything. And it was so different than what I had learned in California at UC Berkeley when we were taught, to, taught about an objective reality. And this has been a, a constant discussion in the academy on these programs. So I think you're, uh, I'm just coming back to the last point you made about different ways of knowing. Uh, we do need a different way of knowing that's much more synthetic, that takes into account the perspectives I don't even want to call them cultural specific, uh, specific, but the fact that we that a lot of what we're taught and teaching is by one cultural bias, which uh, is not the way the whole world views things. It's a very complex issue. But just flagging it for future discussion, not for resolution. Bubble, please. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, um, I wanted to breach this uh, this uh, line of discussion we have here with uh, a session we had this morning when we discussed education for societal transformation and what should be the different form, forms of embracing new models of leadership through education. And one of the conclusions from that panel was that we actually need to move to a new model of leadership, the idea of shifting towards leadership that is distributed, that is inclusive, that is spread all across the spectrum of society, that transcends the uh, oppressive models of leadership towards the, the post-oppressive one, the inclusive one that will be not Eurocentric anymore, will not be anthropocentric anymore, but will be more, let's say, truly global, if we're talking about global transformative leadership. And in that regard, one of the questions that we held in that session was, what if we have to create programs and le uh, learning spaces where we don't yet know who are those designated leaders for the world. So in that regard, if this program is in service of the global transformative leadership, what is that role that it can play? And maybe one of the roles that we need to look at is the new epistemology that is required to hold that new model of leadership. So rather than to see this as a, as a space where these designated leaders are preparing, we can see the program as a way of creating the space that enables many more leaders at different levels in different places to step in. So in that regard, we require acad where academic can play the role. It can play the role to intellectually empower and, and, and support uh, this transformative leadership uh, methodologically develop different tools for, for these leaders and create certain infrastructure for leaders. And these are three particular roles that where the, such a program will be required. And if we say we are focusing on epistemology, the ways of knowing that are required for the new model of transformative leadership to happen, we certainly need to look at issues such as social construction of knowledge non-rational, non-Western ways of knowing, including maybe not on the Eastern traditional religious deeply rooted in Hinduism or Chinese systems of knowledge, but also indigenous way of knowledge. Uh, but in addition to that, we need to look at emerging ways of knowing, such as collective intelligence or data science, artificial intelligence, and to see how we can synthesize those to actually create new ways of knowing for a very complex world where on one hand we are able to hold this for humans, but how can we also hold it for all the planet to be inclusive to non-humans, to other entities, to the planet itself, to other species, 
what are the tools that support conversation and inclusivity for all entities on this planet to work together to the new model of global governance. And I think that would be, uh, that can become a space to actually ask this kind of questions and to create tools for it. That's, I think, what can be the role of, the, of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Spasiba. Uh, so, uh, John Hans uh, wanted to join us. And so let's focus on questions three and four. Uh, in fact, you know, we cover almost all the questions uh, uh, step by step uh, listed on this slide. Go ahead, John Hans. Um, After that, Janani, please. She's also trying to speak. Okay, good. After John. Okay, but, great. But Thank you very much. I would just like to really amplify and to um, assess what Pavel, Thomas and Olivia were saying. Um, because when I look, here we are and we are talking about um, leadership. Whose leadership? Um, we, we are, the majority of us um, connecting today, um, we, we do not represent China, we do not represent Africa. Where is the voice of the Middle East? And I think exactly to the point that you mentioned, Pavel, I think if we want to say that we are truly inclusive, I think we need to make an effort to um, bring in um, those voices, um, because when we take leadership, um, and, and I think we can um, debate and we can articulate and we can look at uh, paradigms, but who's leadership? It all depends from where you stand and how you're going to look at all these different paradigms and theories. Um, and where I would like to um, ask us to be a little bit more, um, less focusing on where we sit in terms of universities and the higher diploma, I think we need to look at the dual track. Yes, we can influence the debate, we can contribute to scholarship, but we certainly can facilitate and create debate. Where we can facilitate, it is not going to be an easy discussion because in reality, what we are going to do is to directly in a way challenge the conventional wisdom of how much, so much of the academic practice and how um, power, um, it goes straight back from uh, uh, Kant and how Kant uh, framed uh, the rule of law, natural law versus um, man-made law. And, and we are in reality going to challenge that. And I just think the more inclusive we are in the consultation and that we can include and and this is where i just want to say olivia hats on because when you said um you know the 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 objectives is missing and the way that we can do that is by clearly articulating the learning outcomes and the le learning outcomes can be framed Thank you. Oh, okay. okay can be framed two seconds can be framed around the subject knowledge and understanding but knowing that it is going to be context specific rather than um, from a European or from an American or from a X, Y, Z perspective. Then there is the notion of um, higher order thinking, critical thinking, synthesis, evaluation. That is a critical skill. Um, and then the application of what has been learned. Um, and it comes back to those life skills. I want to push th that a little bit further to say, it's not about the um, life skills, but it's going to be about that leadership and professional capital that is going to help the individual um, to, to contribute in that transformation that is needed. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, obrigado, Hans York. I forgot to introduce you. Uh, you are... Uh, <clears throat> coordinator of online learning and uh, educational pillar with uh, UN8 uh, um, and uh, with UNITAR, okay, and trade. Thank you. Jimnia, uh, before, may, could I comment on that? Because I think it's vital and I have something to say on it. Okay, go ahead. I wanted to say that uh, I, I totally agree with John Hans, uh, 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 his point about inclusiveness, and that means being truly global. 
uh, not just speaking for Europe or the West. And uh, as someone who's worked in Asia for the last 30 years, I, I can only laugh at some of the perspectives that people come up with. They just do not know what's going on there. They just do not know. So we need to, and that, it's where two thirds of the economic action is now in the world. It's ridiculous, but it just keeps going. It's, it becomes increasingly embarrassing. But I wanted to say the vital issue, especially if you look at places like Africa, if you want to be inclusive, it becomes a matter of funding. And I think that one of the distinguishing features of this master's course should be that those special people who, who teach there and the special people who come to learn there are the, the first group well paid and the second group should be at a minimum fee or free. They should be selected on merit and with total inclusion. And that means we need external sponsors who fund the institution or provide scholarships. Otherwise, it's, it's not realizable. And I've been thinking about how that could be done. And I think we, sh we should tap into the private sector for that okay. and create an institute for that purpose. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Let's uh, talk, uh, ask uh, Janani about inclusiveness and her uh, perspective from India. Uh, to, to help us to understand better the needs, you know. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, to, to respond also to uh, John Hans, uh, we might offer some of these courses, uh, not just for degree, but uh, as uh, free, you know, courses. And then, so I mean, we, we should be very flexible, you know, in terms of meeting this, uh, the demand. Uh, doesn't need to be just uh, the, the master degree. Okay, uh, Janani, are you with us? Thank you, Spikni, yes. Please. When we talk about our future course, I believe all that is taught in what we design, it needs to be contextual, relevant, based on life, the student's own life. When students can relate to what they are learning and know why they are learning what they are learning, it becomes relevant, real. Today we have many, many students asking, why do I need to learn this? How am I going to use this? Of what use is this going to be to me, to anybody? That question is not going to arise when they are shown, when they are able to see, to some extent at least, how they're going to be able to use what they're learning such as you know, for, a, for a greater social benefit. When youngsters see a purpose in what they're being asked to learn and do, they begin to enjoy the process because learning must be a joy and it is not one now, not to many, many youngsters. So we need to link learning to life. There is an abstraction now, a, a vertical fragmentation between the different uh, subjects, a horizontal fragmentation between the learning and the learner. So we need to bridge this gap so that the students can relate personally and collectively to what they are learning, relate what they are learning to their lives, to the lives of those around to society. Then that way, I believe education comes alive and alive. And this, this life can differentiate it from, from a lot that is being offered to students uh, today. There is, there is a quote from uh, an Indian spiritual book. There is no waste in nature. So for this question that, uh, that, I think you, you displayed some time back. What knowledge should we focus on? Everything has its value. All that we teach our students, it has its value, but that value is utilized when we show them what, they're, how, what they are learning relates to the world, to them. When you, you know, zoom in too close to a picture, you can sometimes see the individual brush strokes. Today, digitally, we do that. When you zoom into a picture on the computer, you see only the pixels, those tiny dots, and that can sometimes hurt your eye when you stare at them for too long. But that is what we are doing with knowledge now, when we separate knowledge into small compartments and give it to our students in pieces. So we need to be able to you know, show them this complete picture. It's almost like giving them you know, petal by petal and asking them to imagine the flower. That's not very easy, the reconstruction may not be accurate. Some of our speakers talked about uh, 
integrated thinking, transdisciplinary thought. Our, our students, our future leaders, they need to be uh, capable of this integrated thinking so that they don't adopt a piecemeal uh, approach to solve a complex problem. And that is possible when through our teaching, through our course, we give them that bigger picture, let them see the whole and how their part fits in. So it enables uh, them to see their role in the world. They're better able to understand social processes when they see the bigger picture. And that understanding empowers them as well to make an you know, impact in society and specifically in the Indian context I would just like to add that uh, liberal arts education and flexibility is not something that exists it's not at all prevalent it's only in a, in a very few select places and sometimes the students have to select a course uh, a set of subjects at the age of 15 and after that there is not too much flexibility allowed to them and so I believe in what we do, we need to inculcate that, you know, flexibility, a liberal arts, a greater exposure so that uh, integrated thinking starts with the way we teach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zanani, for your excellent contribution. I should uh, introduce Janani, a senior research uh, uh, as analyst at uh, Mother Service uh, uh, Society but she is a great uh, spirit of uh, World Academy of Art and Science and helper in, uh, in many of our programs, including CADMUS edition, conferences, and so thank you very much for your contribution and we, we hope for your further contributions. Okay, now uh, we are in fact, you know, focusing on the three questions, I mean, third, fourth, and fifth uh, already. Uh, Gary, would you like? I see that you wanted to 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 well, say something. Them and you don't. We, I think we're looking at the same picture, but I see Christine has been wanting to talk. So please, let's give her okay. a long time. Okay, thank you, thank you, Gary. Um, I, I'm just um, trying to understand because it's my first participation to this discussion about this program or courses. But what is maybe not clear enough, and I think this uh, join uh, Olivia uh, remark is what is the audience targeted? Because I have the feeling that some of your comments are made for, uh, I would say, uh, classical uh, students uh, for a first degree, a first master degree. And at the same time, you have the objective in the paper of equipping diplomats, UN staff, and uh, NGOs. So I think these are quite different audiences. And of course, the, um, the observation made uh, by uh, Grazina at the very beginning about transdisciplinarity is different. Because if you go for, I would say, more advanced audience, the transdisciplinarity is, um, is a, a plus, is an advantage, because they all have their own profile, they have their own discipline in the way. So I think the perspective is a bit, of course, different depending on the audience targeted. But this is, I think, this is one first observation. The second one, maybe because it has been raised by many of you, um, I think what is very important in the content and context discussion is um, that, uh, for example, the idea, and I think here uh, it's shared by everyone, the idea is to deal with the main challenges we are facing today. So I don't know, take human rights migration or peace, security, humanitarian affairs or trade and development. So I think what is very important and what is missing today in the whole education programs is to look at this topic from different perspective. Look, uh, if we, we take human rights, uh, you will look at a different, uh, a global perspective, how it is dealt with at global level, how is it dealt with at regional level, whether it is European, Asian, or South American perspective, but we look at them at regional level, and then we look also at it at national or local level with the same kind of issue and see what are the, the challenges for each level in a certain way. And this, I would say, this different perspective can be brought by the professors or speakers or practitioners, 
but it can be brought also by the cohort of participants because they will be coming from all around the world and they will bring their own experience. And I think that this, uh, this combination would, of course, enrich uh, our potential uh, future program, whether it is a master or a, a specific course. And, and this is, of course, two different lines that we have to maybe differentiate or distinguish each of uh, or the other. Yeah, this is, uh, well, of, of course, inclusiveness, I fully share. Uh, we ha it has to be done at all levels, of course. Yes, thank you. Thank you, merci, Christina. You touched really the, the issue of peer learning. If we are creating the uh, community learning, we, mm -hmm. and we, we serve as facilitators. We learn from each other. Everybody has the same rights. So this is the way, you know, we, we, particularly it works at the high at exe, executive learner, uh, I mean, uh, um, participants, because they bring a lot of uh, knowledge, particularly practical knowledge, if they share, I mean, they are learning uh, the, the others, you know, and the practical experience, practical cases. So thank you for raising very important issue. This way we are moving to the sixth question, which is about pedagogy and how we are going to deliver. Next slide, please. Big, big, we, we're missing. Yeah, ahead, got it. Ramos would like to speak and Olivia would like to speak. I don't know, Big, are you seeing all of us? No, I don't see Antonio, for instance. Antonio, no. are you here? I, I don't see uh, raised hands, you know. I, I don't know Do you how. See photos of all of us now in front of you? Don't you no. see all the images? Okay, I, I, I need to zoom, you know, but uh, yeah. Uh, if you're in I, the, you shouldn't be in the speaker's view, you should be in the gallery view, where you can see yeah, all yeah. of us. Okay, yeah, yeah. In the okay. right, the left, the right hand corner of your screen. But Ramos would like to speak and then Olivia would like to speak. Okay. The problem to you. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Olivia. Okay, uh, sorry, thank you. I, I think Ramos. Hello. Yes. Is that all right? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to yes, follow please. up on Christine's uh, uh, um, suggestion. Uh, with an additional provocation, because I really liked her uh, emphasis on the need to tackle the topics that we do tackle or the challenges and from different perspectives. And an additional proposition could be um, to be, to totally and, and truly embrace something that is rarely done, mm -hmm. the, the epistemological, what I like to call the epistemological humility that we should uh, cultivate. And therefore, the embracing of in, in indigenous and local knowledge, as well as what we broadly call the Western scientific paradigms of, of knowledge. If we were to bring the language and therefore also the, com the concepts and the cosmologies that are linked to those words into these different perspectives, uh, that would be an incredibly powerful way of making the point that nothing is set in stone and that everything is dependent on how and from where you're looking at it. But, but in particular, I just wanted to say, words matter so much in our world. And even in the draft, there are many words that I would want to be either revisited or accompanied by a certain explanation scarcity being a good example, yeah? So that was just following on to Christine's point, and then maybe, and then I promise I will not intervene again, but another provocation is, what is it that we want as World Academy? Because is this a course that, to be very blunt, needs to bring some money to us? Huh? Or is the purpose to get, to reach as many people as possible with the, the fundamental messages and ideas and openings that we want to offer. If it is the latter, I think that COVID's period has proved that um, online teaching is immensely powerful. And I'm not a, you, I'm a techno uh, a contrarian, but there is something there that, that would, so you could either combine it 
or offer short courses on, on online and then so you got the point thank you sorry <laughs> thank you obrigado uh, uh, olivia uh, gary well i just i'd like to uh, Remus is next and then Pavel, because uh, they've both been waiting a long time. But just to clarify that, Olivia, from at least, we've not voted on this, but I can say, I mean, we want the knowledge to go to the world. The money, we, if we need money, we need money to execute the process, not, which not intended as a money-making, revenue-generating program. We need to fund those that are involved, and I agree with you. The, the least cost, greatest reach is our objective. That's absolutely uh, the intention behind it uh, and nothing else. It's not uh, a financial scheme to fund the academy uh, at all. Remus and then Pavel, please. Yeah, I, I would like also to insist a little bit on, um, the, um, let's say, discussing the topic on different chapters. We focused, uh, in our discussion more on content or how uh, uh, such a program uh, might look like, which is very good because uh, if we have a good concept, after that we can go to the next uh, steps. And in fact, I can say this because uh, I had uh, more or less the same question as uh, Christine had earlier when we discussed Gary in Bucharest. And I said, okay, who will be we? We are going to do this because, you know, in uh, academia there are very clear rules. Uh, just some institutions can organize a master program. You need accreditation. You need a, a lot, a lot of things. And <laughs> I am from Romania. I am the rector of the Romanian School of Government. So if I want to do something like this, I can do it in uh, one year and uh, it will be a very successful program. But the objective is not this. The objective is to have a program which benefits for more than my wisdom and the wisdom of my professors. So to be a collective wisdom from different perspectives and this program to have impact as a bigger level than Romania. That means we cannot be SNSPA and uh, another, uh, a few uh, other people associated with, but to be a consortium of institutions, mm -hmm. academic institutions recognized in their regions, having the capacity to reach different experts out of uh, the very distinguished group of 12 people that we are today here. And under the concept of World Academy of Art and Science, and with the support of, of some institutions, not necessarily academic institutions like UN institution and so on, to be able to offer a model that is accessible, doable. And we started with master program because we, we had to start with something but can be an uh, online course of one week for someone who doesn't want uh, a master program. So we can go up or down or on horizontal way. What is important is to have a model more or less agreed because this model all the time will have a dynamic and a consortium of institution ready to contribute. So this is, uh, Gary, please correct me, but this is a way I seen the concept when we discussed in, in uh, uh, Bucharest. Sure, we will need a lot of money, but in order to reach the objectives, this money is not necessary to be in one pocket, could be in the pocket of each individual institution participating. So we, we are not there for the moment to, let's say, to design the business model of this kind of uh, project. But we do need, first of all, to understand if we really see the need of such an approach. And I see because, in fact, from my opinion, the problem is many times we have some answers, not all answers, in our classrooms. But we are not able to put these answers on the table of uh, uh, people, policymakers, of politicians. So let's try to build this process from learning 
to really implementing some solutions. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Ramus, I can only say there's nothing to correct because I agree with everything you said. So absolutely nothing to correct. Thank you. Pavel, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I strongly believe that there has to be a complementarity of ends and means. So if we want this program to be in service of a new model of global leadership, and if we want this program to hold space for new epistemology that enables uh, global leadership of the different uh, kind, we need to model that in the program. We need to have means, we need to have pedagogy, and we need to have relationship of institutions supporting it that models already the situation that these leaders will step into. So this means that it cannot be purely academic. It has to be a distributed effort that brings academia in partnerships, not only with established 20th century governance institutions, but many emerging institutions, NGOs, movements, uh, companies, startups, acceleration spaces, da, da, da. Second, it has to be very experiential. And it has to be a place where this knowledge is co-constructed, where it's actually built, where data is accumulated where new principles are practiced. It's not just an, another program. It's a, it, it, we have to model a way of being in the program. Uh, I agree that it has to use online capacity and spread the word as widely as possible. But more than that, we need to focus on building up the collective knowledge uh, space where by uh, the effort of uh, program participants, knowledge is co-constructed and uh, uh, each new batch of the program, maybe it's a continuous, we need to discuss this, but it's kind of building up the collective knowledge. It's not just professors distributing to teachers. It's not a banking model, as Paolo Freire would say. It's a, it's a co-creation model. So all of these principles have to be there. And I would emphasize very, very much that it has to be about experience, direct experience of human beings as whole human persons. So it has to emphasize all of these aspects. And I think without that, we will be still in the old paradigm and this will not be a program for global transformative leadership. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Big, uh, we have had a lot of c questions from Anne Schick, who, uh, Anne Schick. Uh, Anne, uh, can, uh, um, can we promote you and hear from Akshay? Can you uh, allow Anne to come sir, on? Uh, sir, sadly, Anne has left the meeting. I think she joined the next session. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Zbig, we have another question. We still have a little time. We're running to the end of the program, but uh, if, if <coughs> we can take one more question or is there anything that somebody would pressingly like to say in response to what we've already discussed, because we've discussed... If, if I may, uh, uh, Gary, I wanted to respond to Pavel because I really agree with what he said. Uh, it's really important. And leaders are not the kind of people who need to be told what to do. What they need to learn is how to find out themselves about any information, any knowledge that they need to deal with matters as they arise. And I would therefore recommend keeping the fixed content, content to a minimum and designing a group research tasks that provide self-managed learning experience. It's what they call active or participatory social learning and all the evidence in pedagogy today shows that it has the, the most beneficial impact on learner outcomes. May I? Speak, may I? Yes, of course, Kasna. <laughs> I got it. Uh, thank you. Um, we are in a pretty good situation because if there is no um, standard for such a program as we are going to create, uh, uh, we have a full freedom. So this, uh, this is uh, one thing. So we don't need to be too much backward oriented and to look at uh, how other programs were created because we have to create something, something new. So if anybody has, uh, has not experienced this, so uh, the, the, our focus should be rather on uh, 
recruiting the best uh, and the, the most diversified uh, team of people uh, who are interested in the field, uh, who are uh, creative, uh, uh, who are angry for success, so that they have those uh, hungry minds, uh, they want to create some, something valuable. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, we don't need to tell them, you know, the, the whole pedagogy, how they should be taught, because nowadays when I'm looking at how students uh, learn, it is not necessarily our uh, lectures and not books. And personally, I love reading books, but uh, the majority uh, issue, the, the, the most important issue in a their path of learning, if we refer to young people, is uh, the keywords that they can Google and find uh, what is the, the, the variety of opinions, sources that they can find in internet and they are looking at the dates, whether they are contemporary uh, opinions and nobody looks at the older ones, uh, except from historian, of course, because they, they are always uh, backward oriented and uh, they have to, uh, to read uh, the, the facts uh, from the history and try to find uh, their um, uh, uh, updates uh, the, for in, in the new new history um, and to take take up some conclusions some some reflections but these people uh, will be responsible to co-create so if we uh, refer to um, uh, Albert Einstein saying that one who does not investigate the impossible does not make a discovery and our program should be rather of the discovery type so they will propose a set of uh, rules and ways how they want to learn uh, but the capital that um, that we will be basing on is uh, their uh, erudition their knowledge their uh, uh, passion to act passion to discover and passion to share uh, so um, i have some experiences from the program that's big mentioned at the beginning when we were um, introducing the executive MBA program to Poland um, at the time when there was a very traditional system of education and the MBA standard did not exist. The, the economy looked totally, uh, in, totally differently. So uh, the question was, what will be the value of such education? Uh, first of all, we had a fantastic partner. So uh, I, I think that in this uh, uh, community, we can count on very, very important and valuable and uh, prestigious partnerships. Um, uh, so this is this is always already uh, done, and uh, second uh, that uh, the the standard we will create the standard. So we don't need to look for the existing barriers uh, if we have uh, the the followers. So there is no leaders without followers. And in case of of, of the Wemba program, there was a number of people who were just curious what type of education we can offer to them. Uh, how it will be perceived by potential employers or what businesses or what types of activities uh, or institutions they could set up by themselves. And it really worked very well. So uh, the standard after some time was accepted because uh, there was uh, a number of employers who wants to, to, to pick them up immediately after a graduation. And those people show the immense um, um, portion of uh, activity and the uh, and, um, um, propensity to change uh, the existing um, the practices in business. So uh, we still have contacts and I see that, um, uh, that this is the power of good example. So if you create something valuable and if you have those followers, then you don't need to take care about you know, other uh, barriers, uh, how they refer to existing curricula or to uh, institutions, um, restrictions, and, and, and so on. So I'm very, very much optimistic about uh, uh, this new proposal because it's different and people are looking for something that makes them different and, and uh, allow them to be uh, uh, the, the leaders and um, you know, just differentiating from, from the masses. So this is something that is needed. And I also want to point out that uh, sustainability is much more popular in the younger generation. They are very sensitive to those issues. They want to have uh, the, uh, the safe uh, future uh, and uh, they don't want to uh, leave uh, all, uh, all this future to, to, to those who now set up the rules. They want to set up their own uh, rules. And uh, the, 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 the situation is that we don't know what will happen, like happened here with, with the COVID-19, uh, because there is a lot of unknown unknowns. So 
you don't know what will happen. So if we do not create the patterns of behavior that are aimed at discovery, aimed at cooperation, aimed at sharing uh, what you already know with others uh, who know something else and mixing this knowledge uh, and uh, convincing each other about uh, the, the, the value of uh, some parts of thinking, so there will be no value of the program. So this, uh, this confrontation of different aspects is uh, I think the most valuable um, component of, of this model of teaching. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing this question. It, it, it goes very deeply with what I feel also that uh, what the world needs today is not more, the specialist that has become the standard uh, is no longer the uniqueness uh, the person who understands the wider context is the person who has something unique today and, and an invaluable perspective. Just an anecdote to illustrate this. I had a young woman who uh, worked with us in India for a year. She was a computer scientist working at a big international company and she was bored and she left it. And she spent one year studying issues like this broadly speaking, and the same company hired her back at twice the salary. <laughs> not, to do the, not to do the customized specific, specific work that she had been doing, but to train others to how to think out of the box and to solve problems and innovate and, uh, and look at new opportunities. So I think uh, it's a very exciting possibility and uh, thank you for what you said. Uh, I think that we've used up our time. Anybody with an urgent press, I want to thank you all for a rich discussion. Janani. Just a very, very brief comment. We need to liberate learning from the forms of evaluation and accreditation that we have designed and largely used today. Not the traditional you know, tests and exams and the grading of students based on what they write in two or three hours, as is the case in India and many parts of the world as well. So we can adopt a, a way of evaluation that reinforces learning. There are several best practices already that we have studied as part of our endeavor to design the future education in, in the World Academy and the World University Consortium. So we can you know, revisit these and adopt the best of these practices in what we offer. Thank you. Yes, John Hans, please. Unmute yourself, please. Unmute. Can you unmute? Ah. Just to, to build on what Jenny um, was saying is, and I think this is also important that we, because we talk about online, but I think there also needs to be a discussion how much of the um, program content. <laughs> oh dear. Well, go ahead, we hear you. Um, it, it needs, you know, will be um, asynchronous and synchronous. Um, and should we not also look at um, the potential of um, micro learning using mobile technology? Because in, in again, if we look at the, um, the Middle East and China, um, the individuals that we are hopefully going to be identifying um, will not necessarily have the time to um, spend a year sitting in a class or um, so, so, so that flexibility of the engagement is really important. And it's again, how we facilitate that learning. And, and I think in parallel um, to the point that Thomas had mentioned, maybe it's also important that we start looking at funding mechanisms because that's always the area and um, the work that I do in, in um, creating, designing and delivering um, these online um, master programs for the United Nations Institute of Training and Research, that can very quickly become your Achilles heel. So it's really important to have those um, financial partnerships to ensure um, that you are in a comfortable position and the way you can then offer these programs um, in a sustainable way. That's the only contribution, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Anyone else? Speak, would you like to close the meeting then? I think we've had a wonderful discussion, very useful yeah. discussion. Thank you very much for bringing so many interesting issues and reaching this. And I also appreciate that everybody
participating in the discussion, presented his, her commitment to work with us, which is very important. We want to expand the number of people involved. And then uh, uh, many inspiring me to digest it. We will prepare the new version. We will circulate uh, with you uh, to have this collective intellectual product. Uh, and then, uh, then you will see, we have the schedule uh, of preparation, but I don't want to take more of your time because we are competing with some other session. And you were a wonderful participant, creative, and then I see the energy for something really new, something which does not exist. So this new challenge. And uh, Pavel mentioned, you know, look, you know, we need to, we have such new challenges. We need to have a new product to empower people to change, to deal with constant change, with complex system. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, looking forward to see you in uh, working on the next, uh, uh, next uh, stage. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.